Our scripture reading this morning is Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 12. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before her shears is done. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked. And with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the grave, and he shall divide the spoil and the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. As we come this morning, we think of the suffering of our Savior. And as we sang, stricken, stricken, smitten, and afflicted, we think of that as we come to the Lord's table this morning, uh, partaking of the elements of the Lord's Supper, broken bread representing His body broken for, our, uh, for us, and the fruit of the vine representing His precious shed blood for us. When we think about what's stated here, and as we've said before, I remember hearing one man on radio who was a converted Jew, and uh, and it's really neat, and you may remember the story, but it, it's really neat. He he was he grew up in a synagogue, and his rabbi always said, "Never read Isaiah 53." And uh, so I guess that's like telling the kid. You know, it's not that, that whole thing about not having a bean up their nose. I don't know who ever thought of that, but don't do it. I don't, I don't know if the kid would have ever thought of it if it hadn't been said. But anyway, uh, and so so this man was told, don't ever read Isaiah 53. So, of course, what did he do? He read Isaiah 53 and knew that the description there of this uh, suffering one of whom is spoken these words, uh, was the Messiah. He, he knew plainly that, that, that it's the only one who would fit what's said there. And he, by the grace of God, he came to know Jesus Christ as his Savior Lord. And so I just think it's great like that. And so we want to look at that in, at these verses this morning. We have an account of the sufferings of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Quite a bit was said before more said here said uh, it says that he had <clears throat> excuse me he had griefs and sorrows being acquainted with them he kept up that acquaintance 
and didn't grow shy concerning that. And, uh, but as it says, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yea, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He had blows and bruises. And where it says there that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He had these blows upon him. All along he was smitten. All along he was, he was um, uh, rebuked. All along he suffered. And at last he was smitten with the hand. And it was blow after blow that he suffered. He had wounds and stripes. One man wrote, he was scourged not under the merciful restriction of the Jewish law, which allowed not above 40 stripes to be given, the worst of malefactors, but according to the usage of the Romans. And his scourging, doubtless, was the more severe because Pilate intended it as an equivalent for his crucifixion, and yet it proved a preface to it. He was wounded in his hands. He was wounded on his feet and on his side and other places. It was ordered that not one bone of him would be broken and not one was broken. Yet he had scarcely any part of his whole body from crown, the crown of his head to his feet to the soles of his feet which were nailed to the cross. Nothing appeared but wounds and bruises and he bore those for, for us. He bore them for us, for our sins, and paid the price for it. And when we come to this table this morning, we hope that we'll be reminded of that. If there are times we may come to thank him of not wanting to, to serve our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in any way whatsoever, rem be reminded of what he had done. Think of these wounds. Think of these bruises. Think of this mockery that took place. Think of him being nailed to the cross. He was, as we read in verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as the sheep before her shears is done, so he openeth not his mouth. He was oppressed. He was treated in a terrible way. He was not treated in any sort of judicial way. There was laid to his charge, which, of which he was perfectly innocent. We know that he was without sin, yet he bore our sins upon himself that we might have everlasting life. He was afflicted both in his mind and, and body. He was in, treated terribly. That was laid to his charge of which he was innocent. You imagine charging Jesus Christ, God the Son, with all this wickedness. And there was not one of those that was a part of his life but he did bear our sins that we might have everlasting life he as we said he was afflicted those who were in power certainly the Romans would have encouraged this sort of thing but he was seriously afflicted the oppression which had taken place our Lord Jesus, though, when he was oppressed, he was afflicted. He was judged and imprisoned. Not drawing any comparison at all. Let me preface this. But I think about our brother in Christ, Peter Lacayo. He's been tortured. 
He's been beaten. Attempts have been made to take his life. And all sorts of wicked things were done. And yet none of them have prevailed. None of them have. Christ took upon himself our sins. He was completely innocent. There was no unrighteousness in him at all. Yet he bore our sins that we might have everlasting life. It says that he was cut off by his death from the land of the living. Though his life was useful, he healed the sick, he restored sight to the blind. There were those who were healed of horrible afflictions, and they were healed by our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. They stoned him. You would think they would stone him, but he was stricken to death, to the grave that was grave was that was made for the wicked. He died with the wicked. He was crucified between two thieves, one of whom was set free through his receiving Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. He, they, excuse me, he was stricken in death. So he was buried with the wicked. Though he died with the wicked, and, and though he endured that, yet God in providence ordered it. In reading through Isaiah 53, as we said, we could read this like in you know, verse 7, he was oppressed. For me, he was afflicted. For me, he was bruised, as we said before, for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. But it speaks of his suffering. And that's for those that bring healing to those who are who know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And we rejoice in it. It said he, he was afflicted as in, enemies certainly looked upon him as su suffering justly for his crimes. What crimes could they list? He was without sin. Being God the Son, he was without sin. But those of the, of the Romans and others looked upon him and mocked him and, and said that, that he was guilty of these things. They said that he had been forsaken. We read in Psalm 71 verse 11. Psalm 71 and verse 11. Saying, God hath forsaken him. Persecute and take him, for there is none to deliver him. And so he was mocked. He was scorned. He was ridiculed. It's certainly true that he was smitten of God, as it says in, in verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his day, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And as we were saying before, and like in verse 9 where we had mentioned this fact, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. So as we come to this table this morning, may we be reminded of this sacrifice 
of our Savior on our behalf. It was certainly true that he was smitten of God, and some people read it that he was God smitten and afflicted, the Son of God, though smitten and afflicted, but not in the sense they meant him. Oh, he suffered all these things. He never, never did anything in the least to deserve punishment as he had received and beating as he received and, and torture as he had received. He was charged with perverting the nation. He was charged with sedition. And these things were utterly false. He bore our sins upon him that we might have everlasting life. He was called that deceiver. He didn't deserve that characterization according to his life. There was no deceit in his mouth as we had read in verse 9 where it says, neither was any deceit in his mouth. He never offended the world. The word, rather, or deed. He never offended him, either one. Nor could any of his enemies take up the challenge. Which of you convinceth me of sin? The judge that had condemned him. Oh, he found no fault in him. The centurion that executed him professed, certainly this was a righteous man. And he's the one who died in our stead and bore these terrible, terrible beatings and so on. Bore them himself that we might have everlasting life. Shall we lessen it at all that which is represented by these elements here this morning? As it says here, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, in verse 12, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. We observe here in what way we're saved from the ruin to which by sin we have become liable. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. I know someone had remarked to me once that someone close to them when they came to the part where the scripture says, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. That's it. I'm not going to have anything to do with it anymore. They didn't want it. We think what's pictured here with these elements, his precious shed blood, his broken body, is taking upon himself our sins that we might have everlasting life. And we humble ourselves before him and rejoice in his paying the price that we might have everlasting life. The laying of our sins upon Christ implies that the taking of those off from us that we will not fall under the curse of the law nor will we receive eternal punishment. But by belief in Him and knowing Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord that He was made a curse for us. He put Himself in that position that we might have everlasting life. 
But it says the chastisement of our peace was upon him. By submitting this chastening that's spoken of here. By ch he slew that enmity between God and man. He made peace by the blood of the cross. As we were singing the hymn, I gave my life for thee. We think of our Savior who did just that. As we come to this table this morning, may we give God the glory and the thanks for having been chosen in Christ before the foundations of the world and, and in God's time <clears throat> brought us to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, we pray that everyone here knows Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we pray that as we come to this table this morning, and as we partake of the elements of the Lord's Supper, we pray that we'll be strengthened, that we'll be humbled, that we will rejoice in our Savior who was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.